you're saying, well, it's not explicitly found in scripture, therefore we can't believe it. You also believe things that are not explicitly found in scripture, such as the Protestant canon of the 66 books. Where is that, where is that explicitly laid out in scripture? You may say with the blood of Abel to the blood of Zacharias, that doesn't tell you what should be in between. And I can show you why. And so how do you ascertain whether those things that you believe are infallible are correct? What is your criteria and your judge okay. to look at those things? So why do you believe in Sola Scriptura? Because I think you have to have some ultimate place that, you know, the buck stops. So if, you, if you're discussing anything, um, that you have to have something that you can appeal to as the final authority. The, the reason we have Sola Scriptura is because we believe it's the final authority on a subject. So that doesn't mean to say it's everything is covered by scripture, because obviously scripture doesn't mention motor cars, telephones, etc, etc. But what it does mean that we can find the principles and uh, the truth in scripture. Okay. So we have to have some sort of um, something that we can go back to and say, if this teaching or belief or practice disagrees with the scriptures, then, then there's a problem. Okay. So you said, the first comment is what I want to pick you up on. You said, um, you said that uh, Sola Scriptura, or scripture, is where the buck stops. Yeah. Okay. Is that how the apostles practiced? Did the buck for them stop at scripture? Did the buck even for Jesus stop at scripture? Because I can show you multiple places where it did not. For example, um, in Matthew, Matthew appeals to tradition in terms of a prophecy about Christ. Because Matthew says, um, I believe it's Matthew chapter two, he says that he will be called a Nazarene as it's mentioned in the prophets. Now, the problem with that, for you all due respect, the problem for that would be, is that he will be a Nazarene according to the prophets is not found in the prophets, in writing. It's not actually found in writing. There is nowhere within the Old Testament text, Deutero, Deutero canon or the, uh, what you consider true uh, Old Testament canon, it's not found anywhere. So then it becomes a case of where is it found? You either have one or two options. Either Matthew is wrong and he got something wrong there and he doesn't know the Old Testament, which is, we would both agree, agree would be wrong, or he's appealing to something that came from the prophets, not through written, but through oral. So um, some people might answer and say, well, the Nazarene there, in, in the book of Judges, it says he will be called a Nazarite. Well, that's conflating two different things. A Nazarite and a Nazarene are not the same thing. A, a Nazar I'm sure you're aware of that, a Nazarite, would be someone who took an oath, who could not drink wine, could not cut their hair, etc, etc. We know Jesus drank wine, therefore he could not be under that oath, otherwise he would be guilty of breaking the oath. So that's a case where Matthew appeals to oral tradition, okay, uh, a prophecy that's found in oral tradition rather than the written text. So, my, But going back to what you said about the buck stops there, that's somewhere where the buck didn't stop, because it didn't stop in scripture, it went to oral tradition. But then, as which I said, the, oral then as I said, the apostle or well, prophetic oral, tradi oral tradition. So which, which, which? So who were they quoting? The prophets. Which prophet? Huh? Which prophet? It doesn't mention, but that, that's besides the point. It still says it's from the prophets. If it's from the prophets, it's authoritative. You must believe it's authoritative because it's in Matthew, and that's not found in anywhere in Scripture. But Matthew says it came from the prophets. But then you said the buck stops with uh, Scripture. Well, the apostles did not practice that because as we was talking earlier, I referenced to you, um, that's a good idea, write down. That's um, that the apostles in Acts 15 at the Jerusalem Council. You're making another point. No, 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 it's, it's, the exact the same, that, that's, that's the exact same point. It's, it's about not. where the buck stops. So I'll give you one more example and then it's all yours. So at, at the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15, you had the controversy over the circumcision. You know that, right? There were certain people saying you must be circumcised to be a Christian, yes? Yeah. So when Paul and Barnabas went up to the apostles, they did not say, let us appeal to scripture. They went to the apostles who had that authority from Christ himself. Okay, I'm sure you would agree with that. Um, and then what did the apostles say? It seems good to us and to the Holy Spirit. They didn't say, right, let's crank open the scriptures and let's determine what the scriptures say. They said, no, we have the authority. We are guided by the Holy Spirit. Then they made a statement. They wrote letters to the churches, which Paul and Barnabas, you can check me, Paul and Barnabas took to these other churches and that statement from the apostles was binding upon the laity. They could not contradict the apostles, otherwise they would be in error and outside the church. Paul even says to the Galatians, if you do this, you are anathema, okay, which means cut off. So the, the question then would be, the apostles made a, an authoritative binding statement that you have to agree is infallible, 
that was not found explicitly in scripture of their time. So because it's not found in the scripture of their time, they're not using Sola Scriptura, they're using their apostolic authority. So the question is, is it authoritative at, at, at the uh, council itself, or is it only authoritative and infallible when it's inscripturated? All yours. The, pr the problem I find with the, the, the context of the Nazarene is you can't actually give me a quote for this, this verse. Even if you could, that's not the issue. But the thing is, there are, there are various ways that people have interpreted the Nazarene and tried to make sense of that verse. It is one of those verses which is very difficult to locate in the Old Testament. Just because it's difficult for us to locate it doesn't mean to say there isn't an explanation. It just means that we haven't found it or we don't know where it is. One of the things is they believe that it's a, it's a pun on the word branch, because the word branch uh, and the word Nazarene, that that's one of, the ver one of the arguments that's put forward. The other version is that Nazareth was a despised place. And, it, and, and people said to Jesus, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Because they believed that Nazareth was a bad, despised place. It was, it was in Galilee, it was, on, it was not considered to be, you know, the, the highest place to live. So the other argument would be that is, it means that he was despised, he was, and as, as we read in Isaiah 53, it says he was despised and rejected. So the other uh, argument would be that it was because he was somebody who, who was despised and rejected and he was associated with a place called Nazareth. So there are various arguments that are used to explain this, but really the, the fact is that we're not basing our faith on with Matthew became authoritative because it became the Gospel of Matthew. <laughs> Whatever was said in Matthew, even if Matthew uses a different source, doesn't mean to say that it's endorsing those extra sources. It means that extra source is only valid when it occurs in the book of Matthew. Now, of course, there are other things outside of Scripture. But, and when you're talking about Paul and the Apostles, of course, Paul, the apostles, and all those people, they didn't have, uh, they used the Old Testament. They didn't have the New Testament. But we're in a different position to the Apostle Paul. We're, we're further down the road than the Apostle Paul. And we know that Peter, we know that Peter called Paul's writing scripture. We know that uh, Luke is quoted in Timothy. Uh, the book of Luke is quoted in Timothy. Uh, in Timothy. There's yeah, sure. a quote that's used in Luke. So we know that there was this concept that the New Testament was scripture, but of course that didn't fully develop until later. Okay, let's get into that, shall we? So, so rather than us do this kind of, I have two minutes, you have two minutes, let me respond to what you said and then we just have a conversation. It's more organic, yeah? Okay. Okay, so you said Nazarene, there's no quotation in the Old Testament. That's what you said. It's hard to find because it's not in the Old Testament. Now, there are that's, various quotations well, that people but try to... They try to, try but to that, that's, that. they try to because it's not there. That's my point proven. That Matthew appealed to something uh, that came from the prophets that was not written down in the prophets. I mean, much like Jeremiah, Jeremiah says that the word of God came in oral form. Jeremiah chapter 25. Okay, And then it says that the Israelites were judged because they did not listen to the spoken word of Jeremiah. Therefore, even in the Old Testament context, they did not just appeal to, um, to, to, to the written word. That's why Jesus says they sit in the seat of Moses. Now again, that's not found in scripture. It's just recognizing there is this uh, teaching authority that um, is not explicitly laid out in scripture. And it's more of a teaching authority that is um, not necessarily um, uh, held simply just by scripture. It's also by the authority of those teaching it, which was handed down from Moses. And you see this in the final chapter. Uh, Deuteronomy 34, where Moses lays his hands on Joshua, Joshua then succeeds Moses, and then the people have to listen to Joshua. So that handed down authority is even found in the Old Testament. Do you see my point? So what I'm saying is this, is that what you're doing, uh, even in regards to uh, this passage, it can be found. You're conflating Matthew with Isaiah, because Matthew, Matthew's context there is not found in Isaiah. You're simply saying because it mentions Nazarene here, therefore this is what it's referring to. That, that can't be done. No, no. And you even said, Richard, that's why it's hard to find because it's not, it's not there. To me, you can argue over these individual little bits and bobs all day long, but, 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 the, but the crux of the matter is where in scripture, because that, because if Sola Scriptura is to be true, it must be found in scripture. Would you agree? It must be. Okay. Otherwise you appeal to something outside of scripture I, to have Sola Scriptura. So what I would ask you is, can you show me anywhere in Sola Scriptura uh, in Sola Scriptura, anywhere in Scripture that teaches explicitly Sola Scriptura. But I, I, don't, I don't understand why the fact that 
this passage about the Nazarene is, is difficult to find or may not even be in the Old Testament, proves Sinai Scripture? Uh, does this prove Sinai Scripture? Because, they're, because it's referencing an uh, authoritative prophecy that is not found in Scripture but right. found in okay. the prophets through spoken form. Like Jeremiah 25. Uh, that's a said, as the prophet said. I think that's what it says. No, it's found like it says in the prophets. Yeah, and I think in one version it actually attributes it to Jeremiah. I'm not no, sure. No, it doesn't. But as found in the prophets. Well, do you know that in the time of Elisha, there were schools of prophets? So in the time of Elisha, there wasn't just... Prophets are not just a single individual mentioned in the Old Testament. Of course not. There were schools of prophets. Elijah... Ah, no, no. The schools, school of, the schools of prophets got their teaching from the prophets. But there were schools they, of prophets. They, they, are, they are not... No, no. Schools of prophets means that they get their teaching from, an individ, from a particular prophet and they teach that line of, um, that line of doctrine. But, but it doesn't therefore Moses, follow... Moses... That, that, it doesn't therefore follow those people who taught on okay, uh, the same okay. teaching as the prophets are Moses also prophets. Said, Moses said when he came down from the mountain and two of the people, 70 were prophesying and two outside the camp were prophesying. And Moses said, I wish that all God's people were prophets. Yeah. So Moses was saying he wished that all pe God's people were he prophets. He wished, that doesn't make them prophets. But that's he a, wished. But that's a difference, yeah, because people, well, I, it, I think he actually was meant that he wished that everyone prophesied. So there wasn't a problem. Wait, sorry, Richard, if he, if he wished they did, that presupposes they didn't. So you, you can't make that argument. No, but he was making the point that people outside the camp, two people outside the camp were prophesying. And when he was told to correct them, he says, I wish that all God's people were prophets. He wishes, so, but that means they don't. Yeah, they don't. Exactly. But what the point I'm trying to make here is your argument that somebody can be a prophet, you can be a prophet without writing scripture. Just because you're a prophet doesn't mean to say what you says is scripture. But what are they referring to? Exactly, that's my point by the way. What they're referring to, they're referring to something that came from the prophets. Well, you don't know, they're, and I don't Richard. know. So they're it's they're, they're, they're Richard, they are no, no, my, you just proved my point. They're referring to something which came from the prophets. Which prophet we don't know, it doesn't say, but it simply says it came from the prophets and it's not found written in your scripture nor my scripture. Well, I, I think there is a case for it being in the scripture. Somewhere. I don't think there is. Well, okay, that's fine. I don't think there is. Well, well we could just disagree about it, but I don't see. You're yet to show me. Okay. I don't see how that makes the case against the canon of scripture. I, I'm asking you, I'm, look, that's not a case against the canon of scripture I'm asking where, 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 wherever the canon is 66 books or, or Jesus or, mentions Richard, the book Richard from, Jesus Richard. spoke Jesus go. spoke no, you do talk a lot and then you don't let me give it give me much time to answer Jesus actually spoke from the book of Maccabees lovely Richard okay Richard Richard I, I don't Richard, have a problem with Richard, that. it doesn't okay that's, well, not, that's an not an argument against sola scriptura. Richard, you have, to, you have to let me speak. It's not an argument against the canon of scripture. Granted, that can come later. It's an argument to say that it's if there is an argument if, against an argu scripture. Richard, Richard, it's an argument to say if they're appealing to something outside of scripture as authoritative, therefore that's not sola scriptura. Much like the Acts chapter 15. How do you interpret Acts 15 in the paradigm of sola scriptura? They made a binding teaching declaration uh -huh. that was binding upon the laity. They sent letters, and those letters were not scripture. They just simply said they sent letters, much like, I mean, coincidentally, much like the Pope would send letters to individuals in the early church, okay? Um, well, the Pope and in the on, early hold church. On, hold on. What Pope Richard, was there Richard, in the early church? Richard. Name me a Pope that, in the early church. Uh, pope Victor, where do you want me to start? That's not the early church. I'm of talking the first the three centuries. Where was there a Pope in the first three pope centuries? Pope Victor was literally within the first three centuries. 199 is when he finished his reign. That's literally within the first three centuries. So where is the office of Pope in the Bible? Okay, we'll get to that, but you're now you're skipping ahead. Let's go back to Acts 15, and then we can go out into church history from there, okay? Well, I, I don't, I, see, Richard, 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 you can't run away from Acts 15. I'm not, I'm not running away. You're trying to. No, I'm not trying to Okay, away. Richard, listen. Just listen, pay, pay, pay attention. You're not so giving what, me a so chance what, to So what speak, I'm asking you is, ben. no, because no, now you're saying, well, show me a Pope Can over we here. have a clock on this, please? What, what I'm we showing need you. a clock, because it's not going to work without a clock. Okay. So, Sam, tell me when to go. Go. Okay, now I'm going to reiterate my question, because it's important. Was Acts 15, yeah, just... the Jerusalem Council, that statement that the apostles made, it was binding upon the laity, was that infallible before it was in Scripture? Or was it only infallible when it was inscripturated? Because if it was infallible before it was inscripturated, that's a, uh, a binding statement that the apostles used outside of scripture, because it wasn't scripture at the time, that's an infallible statement that they made outside of scripture, which answers your point, what else can make an infallible statement? That shows the church can, okay? And then you said the authority for the early church was the Old Testament. I then said, Irenaeus appealed to apostolic succession, he appealed to apostolic tradition to determine whether or not the, Richard, to determine whether or not the, the Gnostics actually had a church or not. So he, in, in contrary to what you say, he did not simply appeal to the 
uh, to the scriptures. He appealed to both scripture and tradition, which proves my point, not yours. I would recommend you actually read Irenaeus. Then you said 2 Timothy 3, 15 to 16, uh, all, all scripture is inspired, God breed, phaionostos, and uh, profitable for teaching, correction, rebuke, etc., etc. Okay, yes it is, but you don't get sola scriptura from that passage. I, c I could show you something as analogy. Ephesians 4 says, okay, because if what you're saying is because 2 Timothy 3 doesn't mention um, the church or, or the teaching authority of the church, therefore sola scriptura, Ephesians chapter 4 only references the teaching authority of the church and it doesn't reference scripture. Could I then, for, then say sola ecclesia? No, I could not. We must take them both, scripture and tradition. So, go ahead. So your, your argument was about Acts chapter 15. The, the, for me, it's not really a relevant point because Acts chapter 15 did become scripture. And so that's why we have a record of what happened because it's recorded in the scripture. So obviously we can appeal back to that, reference that and say, this is what Paul did. Paul, Peter did many things in the, the Acts and the Ephesians but as you yourself admitted and as you said yourself scripture is infallible any other writing isn't infallible so when you appeal to Irenaeus who's a second century source and not scripture that's not an infallible source so my argument is you yourself admit that scripture is infallible but second century church fathers aren't infallible so when something was said and then becomes scripture we accept it's infallible of course it was infallible at the time but that doesn't that doesn't make a precedent because unless it actually becomes scripture it wouldn't be accepted as being infallible somebody in the second century could have said something and it was written down but it didn't become accepted as scripture so it didn't become infallible so you, you, you answer your own question because you admit yourself the only infallible source is scripture <coughs> and not the writings of the church fathers or the writings of anybody else. Finished? Sam? Yeah. Start my time please. Go. Okay, so to begin with you said Acts 15 is not relevant. The argument I made from Acts 15 is not relevant because, because it's in scripture. It is relevant, it is in scripture, I agree, but my argument is relevant because it actually shows the church made a binding, authoritative, infallible statement without using scripture. They did not use scripture in Acts 15, they simply said it seems good to us and to the Holy Spirit. So they recognised that they had authority, so they did not need to explicitly go to scripture, they can just appeal to their authority, which Christ gave them, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. The church cannot, God cannot bind anything on earth, in heaven, that is not also true on earth. So therefore, when they made this infallible statement to, uh, to the laity, that was binding in heaven because it was true on earth. So therefore, they made a binding statement without using scripture. My point is they're proven. Then I would ask you, I'll make another argument. You believe that the fullness of faith should be found in scripture? Yes? Quick nod or no? I'm not sure. Okay, well Jude says, in, in, in Jude's epistle, he says that the faith was once for all handed down. Okay? The problem with that passage for the Protestant, if the faith was once for all handed down, they had the fullness of faith without the fullness of scripture, because Jude was not even the last book to be written in the, in the New Testament. Therefore, they had the fullness of faith without the fullness of scripture. Therefore, they could not depend upon sola scriptura as you tried to say they did, okay? And then I did not say, you, before you, uh, you finished, you said that I said the only infallible, um, the only infallible authority is the, scriptures, seconds, is the scriptures. I didn't say that. My argument from Acts 15 proves that I believe the church can make an infallible statement without scripture, so you're contradicting what I just said. You're putting Time. words in my mouth. Time, Ben. My earlier question to you, uh, Ben, was this. Can the church teach a tradition that goes against scripture? And obviously your answer was no. So my argument would be, and you've already admitted that scripture is the, is the only infallible thing Oh, that's my time. You've admitted that scripture is infallible and tradition is not infallible. Okay? You've already said this. You said it in, it was said in your on your podcast the other day that tradition the fathers are not infallible. But you're quoting Ignatius to make a point. So the point is the only 
to me it's contradictory because the infallible source that we use is scripture which you admit is infallible so I, I don't really see your 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 yeah I don't really see your point because oh, I've lost the thread here but I, I really don't see how this argument okay. works because the church you don't have to take your two your full two minutes by the way the church fine. the church bases its belief system oh yeah we were talking about can you have a tradition that goes against scripture now the catholic church believes that mary was a perpetual virgin it means that it says that mary was born without sin it it believes in the assumption of mary that mary was uh, went up to heaven now mary it clearly says in matthew 1 28 that joseph did not have any relations with his wife until after Jesus was born. And if you read that passage, it's pretty obvious that Mary did have relations with Joseph, sexual relations with Joseph. So this is where I'm, this is the point I've been trying to make for some time, is that there's a difference. And also, Mary was sinless. Fine, buddy. Thank you, Richard. Okay, hang on, let me reset, then go. Okay, <coughs> I just want people to notice, Nothing I said has been answered through this whole entire discussion. <laughs> I'm, I'm making notes of what, of what Richard says. I'm going point by point by point. Richard is just making new arguments without actually addressing anything I said. Um, he then said, can script, and this is me going against what you say again. I'm actually, you know, answering your objections unlike you doing to me. Uh, can the church teach a tradition that goes against scripture? No one says that. Literally no one says that. Okay, then he says um, that I said scripture is the only infallible uh, source of authority. You said that earlier, I literally corrected you that I did not say that, and then you said it again. That is what we call a straw man in debate. You are straw manning my position. I never said that the scripture is the only infallible source of information. I never said that. My argument from Acts 15 proves otherwise. It literally proves otherwise. Uh, then you said, are the church fathers infallible? No one says the church fathers are infallible. No one says that. When we say, uh, when we reference the church fathers in terms of tradition, we're, we're talking about tradition in the sense of they was handed down the authoritative apostolic tradition. They are not tradition, they were given the, the deposit of faith which had the apostolic tradition. They are not tradition. You said, I appeal to Irenaeus as if he's infallible. No, I didn't. I appeal to Irenaeus because you said that Irenaeus only appealed to scripture as his authority. I appeal to Irenaeus to show you from his works against heresies, that's not true. He appealed to apostolic succession and tradition to reject the Gnostic teaching, okay? And now you're changing subject from scriptura, sola scriptura to Mary, okay? You're saying, well, it's not explicitly found in scripture, therefore we can't believe it. You also believe things that are not explicitly found in scripture, such as the Protestant canon of the 66 books. Where is that, where is that explicitly laid out um, in, in scripture? You may say with the blood of Abel to the blood of Zacharias, that doesn't tell you what should be in between. So now, now actually address my points Time, rather man. than ignore me and then make new arguments. Thanks. You, you were talking about um, the canon, is not, well, we go into the canon, but you were talking about Acts. I said that Acts 15 became part of scripture, therefore it became authoritative. You've also said clearly that you believe that scripture is infallible. So what other than scripture, what other than the scriptures do you believe is infallible? This is a question to me. What? other source of authority other than scripture do you believe is infallible okay so that's my question to you what other source of authority other than scripture do you believe is infallible the reason i brought up the case about mary is because it's a clear case where the church teaches a tradition and i'm not arguing whether the protestants do this or not that is not my argument if the Protestants do it, they're as wrong as the Catholics. My argument is, if you teach something that clearly contradicts the scriptures, then what you're doing is you're teaching that your tradition is more important than the scriptures. And in the case of Jesus, it was clear that Jesus had a relationship with Joseph. In Matthew 1.28, it's very clear that Jesus had a sexual relationship with her husband. The Catholic Church teaches that Jesus did not have a sexual relationship with her husband. So this is a clear case where you are placing tradition above scripture. Now I'm not denying that the Protestants do the same thing, that's not my argument. But what we do try to do is we try to ascertain everything based on the scripture. Stop. Okay, reset. Okay.
Ben, when you're ready, okay. go. So you said Acts 15 became part of scripture. Yes, it was. But the whole point is, when was it authoritative? Prior to it being inscripturated, or was it only infallible at the point it was inscripturated? As I've said over and over again, which you are still yet to engage with, the, the clear evidence is the church made an infallibly binding statement upon the church, which Paul and Barnabas took letters to the laity, and that was binding upon them, which proves the church made an infallible statement outside of scripture. Therefore, no sola scriptura. And then you said, I'm writing down what you said. You said that I said scripture is infallible, and then you asked me what other source is uh, infallible other than scripture. I literally have just showed you where the church made an infallible statement. You yeah, agree, that's that, scripture. hold on, you agree it's infallible, okay? It's you say it's scripture. It became scripture. I, I did not no, interrupt you in no. your time. Can I please have some more seconds? So the problem is, Richard, is that you're saying it became scripture, therefore it's infallible. The early church believed it was infallible before it was inscripturated. That's why it's binding upon the laity, fulfilling Jesus' words, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. They bound the, they bound the laity to the teaching of the apostles, okay? Which in Acts, it actually says in Acts, they dedicated themselves to the teaching of the apostles and to prayer. Not to the teaching just of scripture, to the teachings of the apostles. Therefore, the apostles had this infallibly binding teaching authority, which is proven from Acts 15, you have it referenced. Uh, then you said, tradition is more important than scriptures, okay? When did I say that? In fact, I can, I can show you someone who actually says we should keep both scripture and tradition. If you read uh, Paul's epistles to the Thessalonians, in 2 Thessalonians, he says, uh, in chapter 2, verse 15 or 16, he says, you should keep uh, what we have handed down to you. The Greek word is paradosis, which means, you know, a tradition handed down. He says you should keep this both in written form and in spoken form, okay? So what does that then show? What does that then show? That Paul wasn't just simply referring to what was spoke, uh, written, he also referred to what was spoken. Then the Protestant, the Protestant argument normally is, everything Paul is talking about that is uh, written, uh, excuse me, everything Paul is talking about that is spoken is also written, and we can prove that in the... Ben? Let me have a couple of seconds, you interrupted. No, I did. And then we can... Oh. <laughs> I did. Uh, so you're Ready? going Hang to... Hang on. One, two, three, go. Right. So still, my argument is that Acts 15 became authoritative because it became scripture. Yes, it was authoritative at the time. My point proven. Right? But that's not a precedent for something else. That would mean, that would mean if the church, if the church made a, a decree, right, in say the 11th century, it would have to become scripture for it to be authoritative. But of course, anything the church decreed in the 11th century didn't become scripture. So are you saying there are things that the church has said after the time of the apostles that then became as, as authoritative as the scriptures. Is that what you are saying? Are you saying that there are things that the church has said after the time of scripture that became as, as authoritative as scripture even though they never became scripture? Because that seems to be what you're saying. And are those things that the church said, are they infallible? Because because as you've said, the only thing that's infallible, as far as I understand you're saying that, is scripture. I haven't said that. Yeah. Oh, I thought... God bless you. Oh, sorry, I thought... So there are, other, there are other teachings that are infallible other than scripture. I've literally said that three or four times. Literally, I've said that. I, I thought, I, I, Richard, I've told you three or four times, you keep putting those words in my mouth, I'm showing you from Acts 15. I think it's still I'm, my turn. Do, you want, do you want me? I was going to say, I just paused. He did ask time. me a question. I think I just it's my time. Time As far it. as I understood, sorry if I've misunderstood you, I thought you said that script, you believe Scripture is infallible. But what you believe is that there is another source of infallibility other than Scripture. So is that, is that, that's correct? Okay, yes. So, so we're understanding you. But they don't have to appear in Scripture? Not explicitly, no. No. And I can show you why. And so how do you ascertain whether those things that you believe are infallible are correct? What is your criteria and your judge okay. to look at those things? Okay, how, how do I ascertain how we know the church can make infallible statements? Because Christ said, whatever you, the, the, the apostles, those who have authority in the church, whatever you bind on earth is also bound in heaven. The apostle, that God cannot bind something in heaven that's not also true on earth. He gives them this authority, okay? Which is why, when they, again, going back to Acts 15, that's the crux of this argument you are yet to engage with. That's why in Acts 15, they made a binding statement that was, that was uh, binding upon the laity. That's why Paul and Barnabas took letters from the apostles, which was authoritative, but also not scripture. Those letters were not scripture, but they were authoritative because they came from the apostles, okay? Well, that was binding upon the laity. It was infallible before it was inscripturated. Therefore, they did not work under the paradigm of Sola Scriptura. Then he said, show me something from the 11th century. 
that is uh, the binding upon the church. I can show you something from, actually from the third century. Okay, I can show you something from the first century. Okay, for example, uh, you have Pope uh, Pope Saint Clement. Okay, there was a dispute between um, some of the Church of Corinth. Okay, and what happened? They appealed to Pope Saint Clement. Okay, not only did they appeal to Pope Saint Clement, the problem is there. Okay, they appealed to him because they recognised the Pope had authority. Okay, who was still alive at this time? The Apostle John was still alive in Ephesus. They could have gone to the Apostle John, but they recognised the uh, authority of the Bishop of Rome, so they went to him instead, and what he said solved the matter. You have something also which shows a universal jurisdiction of the, of the uh, Bishop of Rome. And you may not be aware of this, but Pope um, St. Victor I, who reigned until 199 AD, there was a dispute between um, some of the Eastern bishops. They appealed to him, okay, and he said to them, okay, but bear in mind it was over the day of Easter, which day they should celebrate Easter. He appealed to them, they appealed to him, okay, yeah, and they even disagreed with him because they believed their tradition was from apostolic origin. They appealed to the Bishop of Rome, he said you must worship on this day, and do you know what they said? They wrote a letter, let me finish my sentence, they wrote a letter uh, addressed to Pope uh, St. Victor and to the Roman Church, Nine. and they said we must obey God rather than man, and they submitted Nine. to the authority of the bishop. Okay. Let me just. Uh, so that's not 11th century. That's uh, way before. Uh, go. Can we have one more round and then we we'll shake hands? Because otherwise it's going to go on for too long. I, I'm a bit confused here. You give me an example about which day Easter should be on. So are you saying the church decided which day they should worship Easter? On? Pope Saint Victor had this dispute with some of the Eastern bishops. They um, they they then submitted to some Pope, Pope Saint Victor's. Um, authority on the matter, yes. That's so literally what happens. When Paul says that every some people treat every day the same and other people have a special day and each person should be decided in his own mind, how does that tie in with a Pope in the third century making one particular day Easter? Okay, no, that, now you're changing. No, 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 so okay, sorry. My time. <laughs> and getting back to, so, so for me, I would say that's a case where it's a ruling by the church and obviously the church has to govern itself. Nobody's denying that the church has to govern itself. But what we are saying is when it governs itself, ultimately there has to be some final authority. And the day of Easter, which day you pick for Easter? Easter is not a, uh, a day that's set in... The early church, they said, some people celebrate every day the same. Some people have special days. It's mentioned in Colossians, it's mentioned in Romans chapter 13. And it's clear from those two scriptures that we have liberty in which days we celebrate. So the idea that some Pope can decide Easter has to fall on this day, again is a contradiction of what the scripture says, what Paul taught in scripture. And I would go back to this whole issue. If you have a tradition, nobody's denying that the church can't govern itself. Nobody's denying that the church can't make rules. But what we're saying is those rules and those governance, ultimately there has to be some ultimate way whereby you can judge whether those rules are correct or false. And my argument would always be that we go back to the source, which is scripture. Okay, this will be my final one, and then we'll shake hands, yeah? Don't I get a final one? That was your final one, I just said that before you had your final one. <laughs> Unless you want two final ones, but... <laughs> Okay. Right, then, ben. Go. Okay. I'm tired. And You're tired. As you yeah. can tell. Me too. Okay. So um, after this, we'll grab a coffee or something. Yeah. yeah. So um, you said, uh, where, what did I write down here? You said, how does that fall into pools each day to their own, basically? Yeah. Um, now you're changing the argument because the original point you made was show me somewhere in in 11th century. You said in the 11th century. I gave you something from the third century. Uh, which is way before the 11th century, which answers your exact argument. So your argument was made, you're now just changing the goalpost of your argument. Then you said, there has to be a final authority by which we can appeal to. I agree, I agree, we have a final authority. But what was Paul, what was Paul and Barnabas's final authority? My argument is gonna continue to go back to the crux of the matter, which was a clear evidence of the church making a binding statement that you have to believe is binding prior to scripture, okay? What did Paul and Barnabas do when this um, issue arose about the circumcision? Okay, did they say, "Well, hold on, guys, it doesn't matter. We can just we can just look at Scripture and determine this for ourselves"? He did not say that. They rather travelled all the way up to Jerusalem to appeal to the teaching authority of the church, which at that time was the apostles. Okay, so his final authority, where his buck stopped, wasn't strictly Scripture. It was to the teaching authority of the church, which has the ability to interpret what Scripture says. That's the difference between me and you. I can take the totality of scripture, Ephesians 4, which says we need the teaching authority of the church. I can take 2 Timothy 3, 
which says we need scripture, I can take all of that and harmonize it into one. You you can only go with one. You can't go to the, you can't go to both and harmonize them. I can. You can't go to infallible statements made by the church without scripture. I can. I can go to both scripture and tradition. I can delve into the early church, like Irenaeus referencing apostolic tradition, like Basil saying that scripture and tradition have the same force. I can go into the early church and feel quite at home. That's the difference between me and you. I would feel home at the early church. You would feel like a foreigner. Thank you.